So I'm Antoine Laveau, engineer at Apera Technology and a PhD student at IRCAM under the supervision of Accelerable. And the presentation of today is a subjective evaluation of our dearly beloved drum, uh, neural drum synthesizer. Well, in music production nowadays, drum machines, drum synthesizers, and drum sample libraries are quite common and quite useful. However, it's quite hard to get quantity, quality, and something a drummer can use. Just think, for instance, a drum machine. The number of sound will be limited. A drum sample pack will have, will have a limited amount of parameter to tweaks. Uh, to tweak, sorry. And a physical model will be, well, good. We'll have a lot of variety, but will be a hard to set up. What we aim is to use neural networks to do all three. We have a first publication, which is about uh, the same network, and it showed it was OK. It made sound at 44.y kilohertz for 1.5 seconds long. But most importantly, implemented differential, differentiable perceptual features, uh, unlike drum gun or neurodrum, which use uh, the results of these. We re-implemented them to be compatible with our TensorFlow, and it worked a bit better. Anyway, what we want to know is, are the sound any good? And how good is the control of our network? First, our network. Quickly, again, what is it? Gener generative adversarial networks. We have two networks. A generator, which from a latent noise vector creates, well, data of interest. On the other side, a discriminator taking real and fake data and outputting the probability that the data is fake or real. You put the, them together, and well, at some point, it should work. Well, uh, we don't use that. We use uh, an evolution, which is called Steigen, where the little latent vector is mapped to an intermediary space. And this intermediary representation is then forwarded to a synthesis net, which means all the layers have the same information. Compared to Steigen, which is a network for images, we flattened everything to generate waveforms and did a few other modifications, like uh, using actively uh, noise layers to, the, to add well, noise to the sound, which we will see is quite useful for symbols, um, but not so much for the rest. What is the our training dataset? We are using ENST drums. ENST drums is quite small, 350 samples of kick drum, snare drum, toms, and close and open hi-hats. That's not much, so we augmented it with Super VP, with a remix of the attack, adding some noise to the tails, transpositions, and so on and so forth. We will see if it's, if it's any good a bit later. Uh, yeah, the big question, how does it sound? Uh, you can, well, get your phones out and scan the QR code. So, um, I'm sorry, I don't have a drum pad for people to hit on. Sorry. But anyway, first, how good does it sound or not? So, we know we have a network that makes drum sounds. To know if it's good, we will use a mean opinion score. To know if the control uh, method works, we will do some physical, physical measurements of the friction of perception between uh, to, uh, well, between uh, whatever. First, the MOS. Nine people took part of the test. Most of them were audio professionals and gave us a lot of insights on the shortcomings of our sounds. We compared four types of sound, the real sound from ENST drums, the extreme example from our augmentation process, the sound generated by Stylewave GAN, and the sound generated by uh, drum gun, courtesy of Javier Nistal. So, style wave gun is never as good as the real sound, but it's better once against the augmented uh, samples on the symbols. 
for compared to drum gun, it's better. It's perceived as better. Well, but but still better than expected. But still, it sounds good, somewhat. Anyway, so now we know it sounds eh. We'll see how good the control is. So we will have to check the percep the, well, the, percep the perception threshold. In other words, what is the difference between two control values which, is, which are perceived by a human listener? So first, what we did uh, is first use uh, basically a mean average error between the target and the output. And we know it's, in general, not that high when we know the control values are between 0 and 100. This was done on a subset of only snare drums. And the mean average, uh, the mean absolute error are, uh, well, are decent. The F1, F2, and F3 are region between the 20th and 50th quantiles, the 20th and the 80th quantile, and F3, the 50th and 80th by being constrained by the statistical representation of the values, we expect to have something a bit more relevant. This is why, uh, this is what uh, the output versus, the input versus the output with style wave GAN. This is our worst contender, the warmth descriptor. The red lines symbolize the max and the min of the data set. The red lines show the 20th, 50th, and 80th quantiles, and the blue arrow bar shows the thresholds of perception for higher and lower. Um, and well, spoiler, it's um, in between. So this is our dear protocol. We use the 20th, 50th, and 80th quantile as our bases, and we will then generate variations around these points, plus plus or minus 8 with a certain step. The test was simple. Every test participant had, would listen to back to back two sounds. One is the, well, the base, and the other one is the, has a certain variation, which is recorded. Once we gathered a lot of uh, measurements, we can estimate a, a cumulative density function to to have the threshold at 50% of people finding a difference between the two examples. To be coherent, uh, the, sample, the generated samples are all the, have the same style, and in the noise layers, the noise is fixed. And that's about it. This is what uh, cumulated, distri uh, cumulated probability distribution looks like. The blue points are the, well, the CDF, and we fitted a sigmoid on it to get uh, more useful results. As we can see, the 50% threshold is over four. It's some, here, it's somewhere around five-ish. And once we gather everything, we can say that uh, the absolute threshold is always higher than four units in terms of descriptors. This is the same with the fitted sigmoid. So the big comparison. We know the absolute threshold of perception is always higher than four. We also know that our average error on the base case scenario by using descriptor value from the data set is lower than 1.5, and in the worst case scenario, when the descriptors are taken at random in the, sorry, um, I it's a between the values from the data set, but not from samples from the data set, is 3.3. From this, we can safely say the error would never be perceptible by anyone, which is a good thing, because uh, it means our control method works at least better than the sound quality. To make, well, to conclude quickly, what we have now is a gun that makes drum sounds that are perceived as somewhat good. Um, we also make longer um, and higher sampler rate sounds than the state of the art. 
We have a good computational performance. We can generate 50 sounds of at a full length in one second in CGT quality. We have now a validation, an experimental validation of uh, the quality of our control method, but also in um, a lot of insights of the shortcomings of our method. And what is next is getting, uh, well, something even better. Maybe at some sinusoid at some point to, get, to lighten the burden of the networks to generate, to generate them, increase the sample rate, why not 48, 48 kilohertz, which is more common nowadays, and the length, since uh, hi-hats can be somewhat short, but a crush symbol can last for a few more than 1.5 seconds. And finally, uh, make, making uh, this compatible with uh, drum pads or things you can eat. Anyway, it makes noises. Everybody's happy. Thank you. So we have plenty of time for questions. Yep. Yeah. So. Uh, it's the last row. <coughs> Uh, yeah, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I was just wondering if you've done any comparison between like different audio representations. So like in your model, you use the waveform, but um, how does like using a spectrogram um, okay. as an input? Have you done, is there any like noticeable okay. difference? Have you done any comparisons between those two? Okay. Why did we use waveforms instead of STFT spectrograms, etc.? First, to achieve 44.1 kilohertz and uh, 1.5 seconds with a spectrogram, you would need to go way higher than uh, what we have here, which uh, if it be a spectrogram, it would be 256 by 256 or somewhere along those lines. We would need to go way bigger, which means more GPU time, more, more everything for, well, it already works with waveforms. And with what we have, we can, if we go really full scale, we can go up until, uh, well, six seconds wouldn't, he, wouldn't be very hard to do. And well, uh, 20, uh, 24 is something we can do and would be the same size as a 24, 124 by 124 spectrogram. Cool, thanks. Um, one sorry. last question, sorry. Um, I was just gonna say, which version of the StyleGAN, is it StyleGAN 1 or 2? It's Tigan 2. Cool. Uh, there's also Tigan 3 now. Cool, thanks. Well, that's about it. So we're waiting. If I have a basic question. So in table two, you mentioned the uh, depth and yep. warmth. And depth, you mentioned it's con uh, centroid plus envelope. Mm -hmm. And warmth is envelope plus centroid, so uh. what is the difference? <laughs> uh, okay, um, it, from, I did that a long time ago, so I need to remember. Sorry. I think it's the first time it's taking the centroid and then calculating envelope on different centroid. The first time it's just filtered and then centroid. Okay. Uh, yeah. I will need to go back uh, into the implementation. Uh, Paul, uh, Paul Sol did a few times, a few months ago. Mm -hmm. That was fun. But yeah. So, meanwhile, Sorry. is there a question from the audience? Okay, so if not, we will uh, okay. move on to the next uh, speaker. So, thanks, Antoine.